Welcome to Heads Up, the ISC research series that keeps you informed of the latest trends happening in the international schools market. Let's get started with our episode. All right, so officially, welcome everyone. Thank you for making the time to join us today. I am Pia Maske, East Asia researcher at ISC Research. In today's panel, we will look at different perspectives about student pathways to higher education. So specifically, we will explore the key trends and issues that came out of ISC's conversations with international school counselors and higher education institutions or HEIs. As you can imagine with COVID-19 and all the travel restrictions, student pathways to higher education have become more and more challenging. So how have international school students adapted? What about universities and education suppliers? So these are the sorts of questions that we want to explore in today's discussion. So joining us in this panel is Lucien Giordano, who is Group Director of International Outreach and Alumni Engagement at Education in Milton. Next, we have Anne Gaust, who is International Recruitment and Marketing Advisor at Tilburg University and the representative of the Dutch Research University Consortium. Also with us is Caitlin Brennan, who is Partner Development Director at Invest in, in the UK. So we will divide today's discussion roughly into three buckets. The first is about admissions criteria. The second is about government initiatives about digital records. And the third is about virtual recruitment. So to kick us off with the first bucket about admissions criteria, I'd like to start with you, Lucien. The research shows, perhaps unsurprisingly, that universities put a lot of importance on secondary school leaving qualifications and academic grades. Something that may come as a surprise to a few students, though, is that admissions tests like the SATs in the US or the LNAT in the UK, these came in as one of the least important criteria. So, Lucien, Education in Motion covers a large number of international school students under the different brands like Dulwich, De Hong, and the Green School. So from the group's perspective, do the research findings surprise you, Lucien, or do they reflect the reality for students? Thanks for the question. From the group's perspective, at the baseline level, it does not surprise us. I mean, to begin with, we know the importance of the internally or externally accessed qualifications that our students are putting forward into their applications. Um, What I think does not reflect the reality for students is the difference between those important, the levels of importance in the US versus outside of the US. So, you know, when our students look at the requirements in the US, we know that the feedback from our counselors across the group is that they're not totally convinced that the SATs are no longer as important as they were before. We see the test optional coming through, we hear it, but the students are not totally convinced yet. Um, In fact, some of our counselors responded to some questions I was asking in advance of this saying that in fact, you know, some of the changes here increase the levels of anxiety because we haven't quite seen the nuance around how applications are gonna be read in the US with or without the test being considered. But outside of the US where actually the majority of our students in our group apply, we know that those particular types of tests are either not required at all in some systems, or they're certainly down the list in terms of their importance. Mm, that's very good insight, though, about sometimes you get anxious, like whether they would look at tests even, I guess, or is it a, a trick? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, yeah, I don't know <laughs> so much a trick, but just, the, you know, there, there's this, cer- certainly there's this idea of how important the SATs and ACTs are. I think a lot of that comes from some marketing, some some clever marketing, and some many years of, of habit and looking at what's been happening with the older cohorts coming through our schools. Mm. We saw that, and I think we'll talk about this later, I'm sure, uh, you know, that this was not a trend that was really, uh, just because of COVID, it was preceding COVID. But, you know, at the same time, we don't really know how it's going to pan out in terms of the selectivity at particular institutions based on whether or not they're looking at tests, if they're really saying they're optional. So it's, it's an interesting time in terms of the testing requirements. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that, Lucien. So Lucien, you mentioned um, 
perspectives outside of the US, right? So I guess a similar question for you, Anne. So for our, from our conversations with international school leaders, it looks like the Netherlands is becoming more and more popular as a higher education destination, particularly for students in Europe. So Anne, do the research findings surprise you or have tests always been less important for university admissions? Well, it's an interesting topic because um, when we talk in this way, a lot of it is based on the way admissions works in the US. Um, the Netherlands works quite differently. We have, a, on the one hand, quite open university system in the sense that we really believe in access to education. So we believe that everyone has a right to education and everyone in the Netherlands who has the right high school diploma should be able to get a place at university. So a lot of degrees don't have further selection beyond just presenting your high school diploma, which is how some other universities in Europe also work. So we have a public well welcoming, let's say, university system. On the other hand, it's a very rigid and standardized system because students um, in high school can go to different levels of high school and only a specific diploma gives access to research university. And what's really important to us is by students presenting this diploma, they show their academic preparedness. Um, so what we do in international admissions is we look at how an international diploma compares to this Dutch high school diploma, which gives access to research university. And this is why we really like standardized and very challenging diplomas like the IB. But on the flip side, we tend not to ask for very high grades. For a lot of courses in the Netherlands, if you pass the IB, you are eligible. So it's a funny mix of being both more relaxed and more rigid. Um, when I look at standardized tests, like for example, the SAT, because they are a test more of ability and doesn't really show what kind of coursework has gone before that, if you compare that to, for example, APs, where there's actual coursework connected to it, SATs are not that well recognized yet in the Netherlands. In fact, I'm seeing that now there are some universities that are starting to consider SAT scores if students are just short on, on reaching that academic credential. For example, maybe they have only two APs instead of the three or four. Sometimes universities will accept SAT as an extra buffer. So we are in a completely different mind frame when it comes to this um, compared to American universities. I don't know if that answers the question or if you have a different angle that you, you want me to reflect on as well. I think that answers the question. I think it gets us started on the different perspectives that we promised at the start of this webinar. Um, but actually, I'd like to uh, bring you into this, Caitlin, now. Um, so Investin provides students with immersive, this immersive experience of their chosen careers, even before they go to universities. So my question, I guess, is twofold. So one is, can you give us maybe one or two examples of the types of things that students do during the program? And two, do you think their performance in the program could be used as evidence for suitability for a degree, similar to how we use admissions tests? Absolutely, of course. So at Investin, our programs are designed for students between the ages of 12 and 18. And on the programs, they work alongside a range of industry professionals um, with the objective of gaining both the knowledge and the experience of an industry in order to help them make the right career choices for them. Um, and so the programs are divided up into different segways, uh, segments that are looking at different um, pathways um, that you can take within that career. Uh, and they incorporate industry specific career coaching to help students make the right subject and university choices as well. Um, but what really defines the programs is the interactive element. Um, so all of the programs incorporate kind of hands-on interactive simulations, demonstrations to give students a, a first-hand insight into the type of work that those professionals actually get up to in their fields. So that might include our young investment bankers trading the pound on the night of Brexit. Um, our young doctors might be learning how to suture a wound on a banana or taking blood from a prosthetic arm or the lawyers might be arguing a human rights case um, in the Supreme Court. So the whole idea is to help students actually apply their subject knowledge, so what they are learning in school into context, putting that into context and seeing how it actually applies to the world of work. And I think when applying to university, I think being able to talk about experiences like that in your personal statements, in your interviews, 
demonstrates that that you are ambitious and hungry and um, to learn more about the field beyond education you know you see this commitment to this degree long term it's not just about the qualification it's about you understanding where it's going to take you um because i think your academics alone um, can't prove that you have the skills to put that into practice. Um, lived experiences and evidence of that is crucial. Um, so whatever we can do to make sure that more opportunities like this are accredited, um, if that would make them more kind of internationally recognized, because at the moment, opportunities like this, including ours, um, are mainly limited to um, personal statements, references and interviews, um, which is fantastic evidence and a good talking point. Um, but if they could be accredited credited um, and used as some sort of substantial evidence and certification um, that might actually really support that process um, from our perspective. Mm, so that's a really good overview I think Caitlin thank you very much for that so that we have an idea of what happens but you mentioned interviews so I'd like to go back to you Anne because the research shows that half of the HEI respondents that we spoke with have welcomed international students using alternative admissions criteria so additional interview questions or maybe additional references. So do you think these alternatives are like pandemic only alternatives or do you think they're here to stay? I think for the Dutch context, I would say any adaptations that have been made um, have stuck more to the pandemic. And now that things are calming down, I see that compared to last year, we are already a bit less flexible and going back to, to the standard model. So in the Netherlands, that also has to do with volume and, and processing. So I think in the Dutch context, it might look very different from, for example, the US or the UK. Um, but I don't see for us any long term adaptations there at the moment, unfortunately. I do have to add, of course, that I represent a research university, which is more academic in focus. There are also wonderful universities of applied sciences in the Netherlands. And I was just thinking, as Caitlin was talking about her stories, I think for universities of applied sciences, there actually might be a really good fit for students to show more of the practical experience that they have. So it's very well possible that at that level or at that type of institution, there is some changes taking place. But from our side at the moment, I see still a rigid sort of baseline, let's say, in place, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. well, I think that's fair. But speaking, I guess, of the rigid baseline, Lucien, so I know you have a lot of knowledge and experience with I guess, shall we say, the more traditional or the more rigid systems, like in the US, where some universities have very strict admission requirements, like you need this score for the SATs. Do you see these universities moving away from these strict requirements? And should they? Yeah, good question. I mean, we, I would first say that there were never any universities saying, oh, you must have this particular score on the SAT. And, and I think you know, prior to this change coming towards test optional or doing away with tests altogether, um, you know, we would, as counselors, look at the median scores and say, well, maybe this is a gauging point for within this criteria, you know, how suitable of a candidate you might be or how strong of a candidate you might be. Um, are the changes coming and were they accelerated by COVID? Absolutely. Uh, they, as I mentioned before, it, it was already going anyway. You know, I think a really significant movement was anything going on on fairtest.org. I mean, that was something that a lot of counselors in the international scene have been following since I got into this industry 10 plus years ago. And then I, I remember very significantly when the University of Chicago went test optional for the U.S., and that was before COVID. Uh, that, that was followed on by the NACAC report, um, which actually came out of something internationally CAC had put together in terms of reviewing, you know, the, the equity in terms of testing for international students. Uh, now, COVID certainly accelerated, as I said, and I am hopeful that it does not return to what it was before. Uh, I've seen the University of California go test optional. I think it's been, a, you know, it, it's a great service to the University of California's uh, cohorts of applicants. I, I read for UCLA as an international reader. I, I think the diversity of applications coming in has changed as a result of this. Uh, I think the research was there anyway, that stand, you know, uh, standardized testing wasn't necessarily a, a great predictor of a student's ability to go to higher education to succeed. So, so the writing may have been on the wall. I think it's a tough sell to international school counselors if you're gonna say that we're gonna go back to the old days of ACT, SAT requirements. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm sure that there will be some institutions who go who go back in that direction for 
particular reasons, but I, I certainly hope for the most part that this is a continuing trend. I, I think it's uh, for the better, better, betterment of everybody that uh, standardized testing is sort of de-emphasized, even though it wasn't as important mm. as maybe some people thought it was even in the past. I was very surprised about that, to be honest, that the SATs and the, L the LMAPs were not as big as I thought they were when I was taking them. <laughs> so right. I like that term, though, de-emphasize. So it's not so much that they're, we're going to throw them away, but we're just not going to treat them as that holy grail for admissions, I suppose. Sure. I mean, I, and, and, you know, when you talk about the U.S., it's hard to talk about a whole system. I mean, there's 4,000 or so higher education institutions, and they're really, in, you know, the U.S. institutions are, are able to really do what they want on institution by institution basis. Um, so I'm sure we'll see all kinds of decisions just like we had before this. Um, but to, to the point of whether or not they're maintain test optional, do away with it altogether, I, I certainly would hope that even if institutions come back or continue to rely on SAT, ACT, that if anything, the pandemic has given us as a silver line is to de-emphasize. Well, thank you for that, Lucien. I actually want to bring in a question from the audience. We got a question from Rachel. So Rachel wants to know, and I think this is for Caitlin. So since organizations like to invest in focus on helping students make connections and apply what they learn, has there been any movement in the business or private sector to support the accreditation process? Because I think, Caitlin, you, you did mention accreditation a bit earlier. Yeah, it's complicated because it will totally depend on the business and then the country in which that is taking place. If I take the UK, for an example, um, we would have to sort of collaborate with the UK government to get that process underway. And that relies on all the universities um, recognizing and accepting this as a, as a new criteria. Um, I know at the as it stands, when students complete the UCAS application form, which is the university application form in the UK, um, as sort of additional activities they've, they've participated in, there is, we, we do come up under the drop-down box um, with, with organizations like Duke of Edinburgh, for example. Um, so I do think the, the more those businesses grow, we we're still very much a growing organization um i think that that the possibilities will widen but on an international level um it's so complex because there isn't a, a kind of streamlined process between all the different application process across the globe um so who who makes that decision that it is internationally recognized and accredited um i think it's a really complex um question to to answer in a way i wish i had a better response for you um rachel um but i I think until until we have more a sense of what is acknowledged, you know, I, I can think about students already who still talked about their experiences on the programs and that um, secured mm -hmm. them um, a place at Cambridge University um, because of the, the experiences they were able to talk about. So um, there is evidence that it's already helpful, um, but the accreditation process, um, I, I think, is, is far beyond our individual control. It's a bit trickier, but as you said, the fact that it's already in the drop down, maybe there is a move towards eventually accrediting yeah. um, programs like that. So thank you for that, Caitlin. I hope that answers your question, Rachel. I do have another question here from Robert. So how does the panel see admissions being viewed if a large number of disadvantaged but equally no less capable students appear from three world backgrounds where SATs or ACTs um, will not be so rigidly monitored and verified. So maybe this is something for Lucien. So um, it's about like disadvantaged, but equally no less capable students. Yeah, I, okay. So this is, yeah, this is a rich question. Um, in terms of, of, of monitored, I, I just want to touch on that quickly. I, I think that, you know, for the most part, we're going to see the same level of, of, uh, review in terms of what's been going on with the, the testing uh, integrity for SAT and ACT. There were a lot of issues with that over the last few years, and I think ACT and AC, SAT and ACT did make some positive steps in that direction to digitize and, and to secure tests. Um, but in terms of the equity issue in testing, this comes back to a lot of that original research. So just to begin with, and I think this is where a lot of the push in the beginning came to de-emphasize testing is that the, the main cor correlating factors to high standardized testing scores tended to be socioeconomic status. And um, I think, interestingly enough, one of the other strong correlators was the level of education of the mother. Um, but in terms of socioeconomic status, you know, it's really important. You, you think about the, the resources that privileged students are able to put into preparation for testing. 
we think about not just SAT, ACT, but language proficiency testing, the amount of money it costs to prepare for and take these tests is just a barrier to begin with. Um, so leveling that playing field is really important, whether that happens at the institutional level where, where universities are less likely to need high test scores for any particular student, I think is important. Also just the cost and the access to, you know, the actual literal access to the testing, which is why I'm really encouraged by say the movement towards Duolingo, which although is a standardized test um, is far cheaper and has incredible access capability for students who are in remote parts of the world who can't travel you know, long distances to go take a TOEFL or an IELTS in person. So I think that's a positive step where institutions are maintaining their need for testing, but looking for alternatives that uh, provide more equity. Um, but my, my issue actually with testing and this particular um, idea around student access actually comes down to these, you know, what the term that I've become familiar with, Halley students, high achieving low income students. Halley is, by the way, an amazing network of, of schools across the African continent and organizations that support students who are very high achieving low income. And you know, from working with Halley colleagues and, and uh, meeting the incredible students and educators there, um, one thing we've learned very clearly is that to acquire the financial assistance at many institutions, not just in the US, standardized testing is still occasionally relied upon. So you see institutions going test optional, you see institutions maybe even not needing tests, yet for students who need to qualify for large institutional awards, they still need to score very highly on these SATs to be competitive. And I, I think we see that play out. So, so I, I understand the point is to find some sort of baseline data to make these adjudications upon. Um, but I, I think, you know, given that these universities are, you know, uh, highly endowed, um, with incredible thinkers behind them. I, I hope that there's some better solutions in the future in terms of creating more access for students uh, without relying too much on testing. Mm -hmm. But um, so thank you very much for that, Luciana. But um, very quickly, uh, just to bring in another question from an anonymous attendee. So what about US passport holders looking to study in other countries if they don't have access to external exams like the AP, the IB, A-levels? Will universities continue to ask for SAT or ACTs? Like, what do you think? Is that for me? Um, I, 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 well, universities outside of the US. So I, I'm thinking of a few different systems. I mean, I see, you know, the, in fact, it seems like there's not really a really clear answer on this, but for example, we have a lot of Korean nationals in our schools. And occasionally there, there's the idea that for Korean nationals to apply to some of the very competitive institutions in Korea, uh, SAT, ACT might be something that helps or is even required. Um, I've seen students applying, you know, Hong Kong is one of my favorite university systems. There's some great universities in Hong Kong uh, that have incredible um, opportunities for financial aid and scholarship. But if you do not have, if you do not have an IB, an AP, an A level, sometimes they will uh, give you the option of submitting an SAT, ACT. So will they move away from that? That's, that's actually a really good question um, because to, to that point, I, I don't know what their alternatives might be. Um, I, I think it really comes down to, and this is a, a big question for us. We have our you know, cohorts of student every year coming out of our green school campuses who do not typically, typically have these external examinations. Um, it comes down to how universities go through their own processes internally to accredit um, qualifications that are awarded at the school level, at the, at the institutional school level. And, and so that is something that's a really interesting direction I think we're all moving towards in terms of international secondary education and pathways to higher ed. Mm, thanks. Um, oh, thank sorry, you it was about U.S. passport holders. So I, sorry, I think the same US thing, it doesn't matter the U.S. passport holder or not. I think it's just an issue for anybody with these particular qualifications or not. Yes, that's fair. So I think um, following on that, just very quickly, Anna, I just want to get your thoughts about the scholarship point that Lucien made. In the Netherlands, are there, slight, are there different criteria then for people who want to get access to scholarship or grants for universities in the Netherlands? Well, the thing is that it's almost like you're looking at a completely different world. <laughs> the admission system works differently. Access works differently. Our high school systems organize differently. Scholarships, there are not that many scholarships because after all, it's a public university system. So our tuition fee is 
close to our break even point. So we don't have a lot of surplus to give in scholarships. Universities do sometimes give scholarships and there are a few nationwide ones as well, which then have their own criteria. But often it's kind of linked to what Lucien was saying as well. We do need something to assess the quality of a student because if students don't present any standardized diploma or accredited diploma or standardized test, we get so many applications and how do you assess which one is a good one and not? Um, so that's the issue that universities are facing basically. And I do understand that for those students who are in that situation who are amazing, but don't present the right documents, that's, that's just very unfortunate. And I do think in the future, it would be great if we could move towards a more equitable world. But at the moment, we are also dealing with lots of students who actually don't have the ability, but are trying to find a way into higher education. And you kind of have to find the balance there. Well, thank you for that, Anne. But I think the bulk, because you mentioned that the, the university admissions have to deal with such big bulks of applications that come in, which I think leads us nicely to our second bucket about government initiatives. So a few governments are working closely with various organizations to create internationally recognized digital academic and vocational records. So the Singaporean government, for example, is rolling out a blockchain-based education certification system. So a question for you, Anne, related question, could these initiatives improve the international student admissions process for universities? And if so, in what ways? Yeah, very interesting question. I definitely think that um, if information was trustworthy and could be shared easily online, that is a huge step forward in terms of access for students. Funnily enough, within the Netherlands, but again, this is within the Netherlands, we kind of have something like this set up already because um, all credentials that students achieve are saved in a digital system and you have this digital ID which you use to log in to different government services, among which is also the uh, system StudiLink, which many here have heard of, which students in the Netherlands used to apply to university. So when I was a high school student, all I had to do was register for the program of my choice at university. If that's a program that doesn't have further selection, they automatically check that I passed my high school diploma, I have the right subjects, and then I can, I, I'm just enrolled in the university without having to do anything else. So we've seen that that system can work quite well as long as you don't have you know, uh, lots of outliers. So I think the, the real gain would be if you could open that up to an international audience, not necessarily an international audience to the Netherlands, but both ways, let's say. So that's why I think something like blockchain technology, the, the main worry I think that people have is that it's safe and that it's reliable and that it's um, uh, you know, both ways. So I know the credential is true, but a student also cannot have their data hacked. Um, and if we could roll something out like that internationally, it would work much better because in the Netherlands, we still face the issue that within the Netherlands and for Dutch students, it works really well. But for international students, StudiLink is actually quite confusing. And it's very clear that it was set up for a Dutch context as well. Um, so that's my two cents about that topic. Very interesting. So the future is blockchain, but also maybe the future is Dutch, sort of. Um, but Caitlin, um, I'd like to bring you into this, because what role could education suppliers play in supporting the digitization of student records? Yeah, I mean, I think, of course, there's, you know, huge value um, in internationally accredited kind of qualifications and records. Uh, you know, there's no denying that. And I think education suppliers, and I was thinking about this question as to what role we could play, I think we organizations like invest in have the power to increase visibility and awareness of the variety of higher education options for young people um and so we have the the ability to actually put pressure i think on um, governments worldwide to proceed with facilitating access um because if you know international um if interest in international opportunities grows um which is obviously what a lot of universities want to achieve and we can support them in achieving that um hopefully that would push um forward initiatives um to to have those internationally recognized qualifications i think it links very directly to Rachel's question earlier about, um, you know, accreditation of these programs like ours. Um, I think that, you know, if, if these were internationally recognized, um, it would only add to a young person's sort of portfolio of, of qualifications and interest in, in the field. And it provides kind of quantitative evidence um, 
that, that there is demand and interest in the variety of options available and that um, would, would hopefully um, push um, governments and organisations to do something about it. Um, I think that's where I would see our role in all of this. And that makes sense. So it's not internationally recognised, but for example, if it's kept in a blockchain, you know that it's an authentic record of their programme experience. Um, but what about you, Lucien? What opportunities do these initiatives present for international schools and students? Right, yeah, I would look at it from the application side and then the post-application side. On the application side, whether government or not, I mean, anything that creates, you know, to some, some extent, a digital wallet, we hear a lot of you know, ideas like this going out there where we recognize that our international students are applying to multiple countries. So anything, anything at all that could make their lives easier in that application process and could be accepted at a university in the Netherlands at the same time as it's being accepted in Australia and wherever else in the world is, is obviously a great opportunity. The post-application side is what I'm pretty interested in. And when I hear and talk about the, the way that the Netherlands is working through this digitally, you know, we polled our students across our group, so our 500 or so graduates from the class of 2021, and we asked them, you know, leading into this process, looking back on it for your application year and, and going off to university, what do you wish you had more of? What, if anything, could the counselors have given you more of? And by far, the, the top answer was transition help. So, you know, in this day and age, I mean, I, I think always, always for international students who are going to be moving to another country for university, sometimes having never stepped foot in that country, there's going to be anxiety and that transition is difficult. I think today, especially given the last two years and for various reasons, um, transition is a, is a real point of anxiety. So anything, anything at all that could help with financial literacy, that could help with those transitions in the practical sense or the even social emotional sense, I think there's some opportunities for that. Um, those two, to me seem to be the big opportunities. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, Lucien. Um, I actually would like to pause here for a bit to remind the audience of two things. So the first one is, if you have any questions, please post them in the question and answer box. And as much as possible, please indicate one panel member that you'd like to answer your question so that we can field them to the correct person. And number two, if you are interested in learning more about the research on student pathways, you can download the specialist report and the white paper from the ISC website at iscresearch.com. So with those two reminders, uh, I think like we can go back to our panel. And I'd like to move on to our third and final bucket about virtual recruitment. So the research shows that universities have leveraged digital channels to recruit international students. And these include the, the, the usual social media and the virtual events. Um, but Anne, what best practices have you seen in the digital recruitment space? And what lessons can we learn from them? Well, this is a very interesting question. I'll try to keep it brief this time. Um, I think some really good things that have come out of this is that Basically, we were able to connect with students in really remote locations, which we otherwise wouldn't be able to do. I've also noticed that one-on-one uh, -on -one or small group conversations in a Zoom room like this one are pretty much as good as the real thing. In fact, and sometimes even better if a student decides to join me in a Zoom room rather than me standing in a random school cafeteria and the students all passing me by. So uh, it's, it's opened up lots of possibilities. And especially when you use the online platforms in the right way, I think it can come as close to real contact as possible. Um, of course, the downsides we know about Zoom fatigue. Um, one of the big downsides I've seen also is there's just a plethora of different options out there. So for us on the university side, it's very difficult to figure out which ones are worth my time, even if, you know, they're only $200, but if I have to stay up at one in the morning, that creates huge pressure on our team. I know you're also in the evening right now, so <laughs> I shouldn't complain. Um, but all these elements make it really challenging, and I felt like both schools and universities have really been searching for what is the best way and the most efficient use of our time and resources. Um, because yes, one school invites me for their fair and that's fantastic, but when 100 schools do, suddenly it still puts a lot of pressure on us and I don't want to let schools down. Um, what I've seen working really well is uh, very fascinating international collaborations coming together. For example, um, there was a group of German schools that wanted to host an international fair, an online fair, and they were really thinking critically about 
you know, we want to make it worthwhile for both our students and for the university. So they thought about a good balance between the amount of universities, the types of universities that they invited, allowing scholarships for universities, certain public universities from Eastern Europe, for example, who would otherwise not attend. And I thought that was a really clever, uh, clever way to collaborate, basically. And also, we tried to do something similar on our side. Of course, we're lucky in the Netherlands that we are a small country and we're used to collaborating. So we tried to do something similar. Um, we set up a virtual fair uh, where pretty much all Dutch universities, 30 of them now, are, uh, are present. And students and counselors can come and visit our booths like it's a virtual fair. And in that way, we try to kind of concentrate resources. So we make sure we are there that Sunday afternoon, but then students can also come and talk to us and they only have to do it once instead of receiving, I don't know how many emails every week about, oh, there's another Dutch fair and there's another Dutch fair. And for us, that works really well because of course, Tilburg University is maybe not as famous as the Harvards and Oxfords of the world. So when I'm at a fair with you know those institutions, I don't get a lot of traffic, but now in this kind of way, we've found a really nice balance. And I'm kind of hoping that these kind of events will stay afterwards because again, for those students in remote locations, it's a really interesting way to get access to information that they previously didn't get. So there's always a very bright side to every catastrophe, let's say. A silver lining, but um, is, there an, is there one that's coming up with the Dutch universities that you mentioned about? Yes, actually, the one that I was talking about where we all banded together, we called it Virtually Orange. Um, and the next edition, we do usually, we've only done it once before, but we do one in the fall as the idea, is on the 3rd of October. So um, I can drop a link to the sign up in the chat if people are interested in that, or is that a bit too much? Yeah. No, I think that would be good. Okay. So I know Perfect. we have I know we have counselors in the in the audience today, so maybe they'd be interested to to join or see what it's about. Um, so thank you for that, Anne. But speaking of counselors, so Lucien, I'd like to get your thoughts about counselors in general. So international schools usually employ dedicated full-time college counselors. And I know that we have a few in the audience today. So Lucien, how has the counselor role evolved in light of universities' virtual recruitment efforts? Yeah, great question. I, I, uh, I also reached out to our counselors to get some feedback here. Um, similar to I think what a lot of colleagues on the other side of the desk would say is the hours have changed. You know, our counselors all mentioned how to engage with the universities, which is a really important part of this job. They've got to be putting in hours late at night or early in the mornings, trying to find all those different time zones. Whereas before you had those universities traveling to you over you know, set cycles and you knew that you could host them at school. I think it's an interesting evolution or, or change to think about what, and I was just talking about this with some colleagues yesterday at another event, which happened to be in person in Beijing. You know, What is the importance of the human connection in this field? Um, a lot of what we do together in terms of collaboration between university and, and high school counselor has to do with trust. It has to do with understanding each other. I think in terms of what students can get out of the process, it means something for them to meet a representative of the university in person. That, that warmth or lack thereof, hopefully not, um, is, is what speaks for perhaps the experience that they'll find when they go off to that place. And so in lieu of being able to go and visit a university, you know, this is what we would talk about before the pandemic. You know, if, it's very hard for international students to go visit a university in person. Um, and it's a very important part of the process for students in domestic settings, or if they're lucky enough to travel internationally during their search process. So we lost that. And I think counselors are trying to figure out how do you, how do you fill in that gap? You know, how do you make those connections virtually as a counselor without going to the conferences? Um, without being able to bring those institutions into your campus, how do you how do you uh, fill in that gap is, is a really important question. I think our counselors reflect that and just the way that they're putting in tremendous effort to make those connections anyway uh, by having these virtual talks at all hours. Now, at the same time, it's it's created access to universities and to forming relationships that we might not have had before because there were institutions that didn't travel. I think some of our counselors and myself specifically can say that, you know, as a result of this and attending virtual conferences or having virtual events, I've met a lot of people in this industry or as, as it were, and, and that they stand in for institutions, got to know more about institutions that I might not have otherwise. So I, I think it cuts both ways. 
but certainly, you know, the counselors have had to do a lot of adaptation, as have our university colleagues. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like the challenges are going to keep coming, but they're going to keep adapting and evolving in a way. But um, so thank you for that, Lucien. So on the topic of human connections, though, so Caitlin, I imagine that the shift to digital channels has also affected that connecting aspect um, for education suppliers. So what lessons can we learn in terms of supplying to international schools and students? Mm. No, I think um, that's a really good segue for me to move on from, um, from Lucien because um, we traditionally ran all of our programs in person at Invest In. So we were mainly um, targeting um, UK based students. That was the um, kind of predominant audience of our programs. So when the pandemic hit, we, we turned around a kind of transformation into live online in just a, a matter of weeks, actually. And um, within, um, I think, a few days, we were getting bookings from from like dozens of different countries. I think in the end, we had a hundred different um, countries that students were attending from. Um, and it was amazing because we had to, you know, diversify our content so that it was applicable no matter what kind of um, higher education institution and students were going to go on to, that that content was, was more universal. Um, in terms of, you know, how we were able to maintain the interactive element, because the reason we'd never considered online in the past was because the interactivity was absolutely central and crucial to our offering it's what made us different um and so online you hear online you think well how could it possibly be um as, as good um and i think the first step for us was was not trying to um replace what you can do in person but actually consider what you can actually do online that you can't achieve in person um and you know Anne's already touched on these points in terms of um you know how we can reach new audiences um ours actually created more space for students who were slightly you know shyer or less confident um to get involved because it was a it was a less intimidating environment for them to be in um so running programs live was crucial and we we really avoid recorded content at all costs um it's absolutely essential that whatever you're running relies on live um, audience participation um so we will use kind of live polling apps throughout um so students actually feel like they're dictating in a way the the direction of travel of the of the session um we will stream um um sessions with professionals where they might be doing a patient diagnosis um, or they might be streaming from university college hospital um, and universities can do this as well they could be streaming um, the campus they could be doing um, you know live demonstrations within a lab with a with a lecturer to get help students kind of actually visualize what it would actually what the atmosphere might be like in that environment and the more interactive and exciting um it feels and experiential it feels um the more impact i'm going to imagine um will have on on that student's experience of of attending that you know university so i think breakout rooms as well facilitate more um project work with smaller groups um and i think feedback is essential we we relied heavily on feedback forms um to shape the, the way that we we delivered our, our virtual opportunities um and to such an extent that i i can't imagine a world in which our virtual opportunities would 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 cease you know i think we will always consider can continue in both formats because it just widens opportunities and now we've become quite a uh, an organization with quite a far international reach and then we're really excited about that. Well, thank you for that, Caitlin. I like what you said, though, about, you know, they can dictate the next direction or the next step. It's almost like you're it's active participation. So you don't feel like you're just watching no. a recording, as you said, because that's not something that you're going for. Um, so I think this sort of wraps up our third bucket. But we do have a question uh, from the audience. This is from Graham. And I think this would be for Lucien. So, Lucien, do you have a sense in the U.S. context of the percentages of top schools that are accepting alternatives to the SAT or ACTs? Because it seems a reasonable achievement, according to Graham, to attend a university, but to get into a top university without those tests or the IB or the A-levels, you know, what's the data in the US? I'm not gonna quiz you, like what's the exact percentage <laughs> yet? But just like, um, what's the sense of, um, from your experience at least? Yeah, yeah. Let's let's first separate just SAT, ACT versus you know curricular type exams, um, a, IB or A level or AP. Um, okay. So and then and then let me also just play around with the word top, 
because I, I, I suspect we're, we're thinking Ivy League, Stanford, MIT, those types of institutions, uh, you know, they all had their various test optional policies. I, I, I would say a good percentage, you know, were really flexible in terms of the last two years in what they would accept. As I mentioned before, and, and I, I think by any metric, University of Chicago or Washington University, St. Louis, these would be considered top schools. And they had already started moving in this direction. <clears throat> Um, in terms in terms of alternatives, I don't know that there's, there really is an alternative to saying uh, SAT, ACT, and, and what's the alternative to that. I think it's if we had looked at those priorities in the review of an application to these institutions over the last however many years, you know, 10, 15 years, however long I've been involved in this, um, you know, we always would have put standardized testing for some of these institutions. Let's say, you know, I can speak pretty clearly about UCLA as a top institution and and probably there was a stronger focus at, at UCLA and the University of California system in general on, on testing, but still it, it would have been hard to rank it above say number three on a list of criteria. You would always have said the student's academic performance, anything that gives the personal insight. So whether it's the essays, the teacher references, um, their activities and what they make of them, and then maybe standardized testing. So it's not so much, I would say alternative, but just that either those tested, tests have been pushed down the list and everything else is bumped up or they're out of the list altogether and everything moves up a slot or there's more emphasis on whatever it might be. Um, I, I think that this particular idea of, of testing and is, is really about emphasizing the holistic read of an applicant. Um, I, I think we see that to a certain extent in other countries too. You know, so I, I don't want to just consistently focus when we come to selectivity and, and testing on the US. I, I think the way that the UK has had to read applications, um, not to do with the SAT or SAT, ACT, but although IB and whatnot have continued, there have been major adjustments to that. You know, uh, A-levels are, are totally reconsidered over the last year. So, um, you know, and I don't think it's, again, about alternatives. It's about, you know, reprioritizing the way that you read an application and, and rebase, you know, baselining within even a one-year cycle and then readjusting as those new data points come in. So thank you for that, Lucien. And I think it's the, the de-emphasizing point that you've made earlier as well, which makes sense. Um, I do have a stray question, so this doesn't belong in any of the buckets. Um, I think this would be maybe for Anne. So Anne, we talked a lot about helping students get to universities or admitted to universities, but what about helping them survive or even flourish at university? I think Lucien already mentioned transition, like helping students with that transition period. But what do you think can universities do or what are they doing already to help international students a bit more? Yeah, what I'm noticing is that the needs of international students seem to have increased a little bit um, in the sense that the transition to university is always hard and to university abroad is even harder. Um, so universities are already doing a lot of things to help students settle in, but a lot of them are very administrative, like helping students open bank accounts or helping them register at the university or helping them find a buddy, which is already a bit more socially oriented. What I'm seeing in the Netherlands is that more and more universities are also hiring student well-being officers. And we already have, um, you know, psychologists and stuff on staff. But what we're seeing is because of all the pressures that students are facing in recent years and especially the emotional toll of an online or of a pandemic and having online classes and all that stuff. Um, it's becoming more and more in the front of our awareness that we have to uh, that we have to be a, we have to be there for these students. And the Netherlands has always had a culture of independence. So, you know, a student is doing well as long as they don't uh, tell us that they're not doing well. And I'm seeing a shift in universities now of actively reaching out to students and checking them a little bit more, especially also their mental health and not just their academic health. So I think that's a, a really important and good movement where we're also getting inspiration from international, other international universities. But I think more and more as the generations change, this is just really needed, yeah. So that focus on well-being, like checking up on how they're doing, because as you said, you know, that transition is always going to be hard, COVID or no COVID, it's always going to be very difficult. So actually, since we have like, but since we're almost out of time, sort of, so to help us wrap up, I do have a question for all of you in the panel, and I'd like to start with you, Lucien. So looking at the future of international admissions and international student pathways, Lucien, what do you think is the top priority 
that still needs to be addressed. Absolutely, for me, it's around equity, access to education in the in the global sense. Um, we see increases actually. You know, the pandemic has not necessarily decreased the flow of international students. In some cases, it's increased the flow to certain countries. Um, the last year, you know, applications to these highly selective institutions in the U.S. have skyrocketed. Uh, the question is, you know, um, what is being done to to include students who are of low income who need that financial support. Our, our group of schools, you know, we're quite conscious of the SDGs and what we're doing. We're trying to apply that. Um, I, I see institutions or movements like the IC3 movement incorporating sustainable development into their ethos in terms of this field. Um, the equality in education, uh, gender equality, these things all tie into the social justice aspects of the SDGs. I think it's an incredibly important time that we're living in, in this regard. And certainly access to higher education is gonna make a big difference in, in so many of these initiatives and the way that they tie in together across, if we just use as a, as a, you know, a, a lens for this, those 17 SDGs. So finding ways for these institutions, these national systems even, to bring in those types of students, to not just be content with accepting the full fee paying international student, but finding access for those other types of students into these systems uh, for the betterment of this entire international education world is for me the top priority in figuring out where to go next in this field. Well, thank you so much for that, Lucien. Um, but how about you, Anne? So what top priority do we still need to explore? I think kind of segueing on what Lucien was saying, access is really important and I'm thinking about it more in terms of access to information. Um, in the previous question, I talked about, you know, uh, online access to information, being able to connect students from all around the globe. And I think if we can find ways to streamline that a little bit more and make it easier for students to find out about these different institutions, um, I think that's beneficial for the institutions and for the students. It's also kind of linked to what Lucien said about the skyrocketing number of students applying for the Ivy League universities. And there are so many other universities across the world that are not in the Ivy League, but that are so amazing for students. And if everyone keeps applying to those top five, it's, it's just a waste of resources and we can find better fit maybe if we can also disclose information more efficiently. So that's something that I think would be really helpful if we can uh, kind of mm -hmm. streamline that a little bit more and band together and organize. I like the better fit angle and the Lucian and Anne's um, top priorities sort of fit together as well. Um, but what about you, Caitlin? So we discussed a lot of things today, but still there are priorities that we're yet to flesh out. So what would you say is one of those? Um, I think from our perspective, flexibility and adaptability is key, particularly over the past 18 months, as we've all seen. Um, at Investing, we are constantly looking at the data of who's attending our programs, when they're attending, where they're attending from, um, what they're interested in. Um, and that drives our business development, you know, what we offer, how we can make it more accessible, how we can reach and improve the experience of students from different backgrounds, from different countries, um, you know, to such an extent that we've now, we're now offering programs in several different time zones um, so that we can facilitate access for students in East Asia and the US, um, because we, we genuinely have had students from Australia um, tuning in at God knows what hours in the morning um, to take advantage of the program. So we want to um, make sure that we can offer them a service that's, that's, that suits them as well. Um, you know, whether that means we're, we're launching in-person programs in, in UAE, in Dubai uh, and New York. Um, so it, it kind of exemplifies that we are data driven and I think you have to be reactive um, and fast evolving and kind of open to that change. I think a lot of higher education institutions can be very rigid. Um, they, they're quite traditional and younger universities are more um, flexible and open to that change. So actually encouraging students to look beyond the, the obvious, the most, the most famous, the most well-known and actually prioritize um, what's really important to them and actually what's going to facilitate their success. Um, and actually that might be in, in areas that they hadn't previously considered um, because those universities will be much more likely to, to, to be happy to evolve uh, and keep up with, with the patterns of behavior of what's going on at the moment. So um, I think 
feeling welcomed by an education institution um, is, is about being heard and understood and catered for. Um, so I, I think it's really important that those institutions can be flexible to that change and adapt their approach um, as the data pushes them to do so. Well, thank you so much for that, Caitlin. So, and there you have it, everyone. So Through the Pathways is this very rich topic. And over the last 15 minutes or so, we looked at three buckets. So it's admissions criteria, government initiatives, and virtual recruitment. But as you've heard from our panel, there is still much to explore about equity, access to education, access to information, and flexibility and adaptability. So if you haven't already, I invite everyone to follow ISC Research on social media. So this way you can be one of the first to know if any of these topics that the panel mentioned would be the focus of a future report or a future webinar like this one. So ISC Research is on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. We are also on YouTube where a version of today's discussion will be uploaded. So before we end, on behalf of ISC Research, I would like to thank our panel, got Lucianne, Anne, and Caitlin. We definitely learned a lot about your perspectives. Thank you very much for your time. I would also like to thank our audience for spending the last 50, 55 minutes or so with us on the topic of student pathways. And finally, I'd like to thank our tech and marketing teams for putting this event together and for making sure that all the behind the scenes tech stuff is working well. So again, I am Pia Maske from ISC Research. Thank you to everyone for making the time to join us and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. For more information about Heads Up, including access to previous episodes, please visit iscforschools.com slash heads up. Until next time.